in recent years, in the last couple of decades, but in the last 10, 15, 20 years, there's been a greater interest in African Americans in Latter-day Saint history, Utah history, and Western history in general. Uh, Dr. Quintar Taylor has done pioneering work in building on the work of others to, so that we know now about African, more about African Americans in the Westward experience than we ever knew before. In terms of Utah history, Latter-day history, the works of people like Amy Theret, Paul Reeve, Russell Stevenson, Margaret Young, Darius Gray, and France Davis has really just enriched our understanding. Could I move this? We can't see you. <laughs> but they're more important than I am. Just it here because we couldn't see your face. It's not much to look at. <laughs> uh, they have, these are scholars who have enriched our understanding of African Americans in Utah history, Latter day Saint, Saint history, and American history in general. And as we look at the works of contemporary historians, we sometimes dismiss the work of the earlier workers in the field. I know I've been guilty of that. But the more I've studied this, the more greater the appreciation I've come to have for a person I never met and whose work I was not thrilled with, but who was a pioneer in the field. I'm talking about Kate Carter who wrote the Negro, uh, pioneer, Negro and Pioneer, Negro Pioneers. I, I might not have that type. But uh, she was the first, hers was the thing that just opened so many doors and, you know, gave you things that you could further explore on your own. Following that, the person who uh, I met and also was, became a very dear friend was Mrs. Helen Papa Nicholas. And Mrs. Papa Nicholas was a very much interested in the ethnic and diverse histories of Utah's populations. And in 1976, for the bicentennial, uh, the publication of the peoples of Utah was groundbreaking in terms of what we know about the diverse experiences. We know more about Scandinavians and various Hispanics uh, and other groups uh, in Utah history. Tonight, I'm going to talk, focus my remarks on the pioneer period, 1847 to 1869. Now, we, everyone knows why 1869 is the closing date, the joining of the rails of promontory. And I know that's, if you're after that officially, you're not supposedly a pioneer descent. But I'm fudging because uh, there's someone who came in shortly after and who I think's presence and work in this community was pioneering work and most deserving. Moi, my friends, Amanda and Samuel Chambers. We'll say more about them a little later. My, I wanna focus on the, the period 1847 to 1869 because it's a very rich period in looking at the, how it is that African or men and women of African descent came to be in Utah territory and what their lives and experiences were uh, during that period uh, in which the population remained very small, but there's a history there, a very important history. The primary reason for a black presence in this, re in, uh, in this region was tied to religion, politics, and slavery. All part of the westward expansion in the 19th century. As we know, the in 1830, Joseph Smith founded 
the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And in the aftermath of the first prophet's death in 1844, decisions were made because of the tensions to seek to relocate outside of the influence of the United States government. And it's the movement, westward movement, under the leadership of President Brigham Young to the far west, which explains the presence of African Americans or people of African descent in what becomes Utah Territory. The departure points of African Americans primarily came from the South, the American slaveholding South. Mississippi, Alabama, North Carolina, and Tennessee were the prior homes of the majority of the early arrivals. In, when the decision was, was made to seek to relocate to the West and efforts were made to organize a vanguard party that was to gather in Nebraska, the Council Bluffs, one of the two. Uh, in that first party, initial party, that left and arrived in the Great Salt Lake Valley in July of 1847, how many were of African descent? Three? I can't see that far. <laughs> Three? Yes. The names of Harkley, Oscar Crosby, and Green Flake are on the monument, President Young's monument, uh, moved a little further north there on Main Street uh, near Temple Square. Three. And they're listed. How are they identified? Servants. Pardon me? Servants. Yeah, as colored servants. Sort of misleading uh, in that they were permanent servants. They were slaves. There would have been five names on the marker, except that two of the slaves, one belonging to John Brown and one belonging to the Bankheads, uh, died en route uh, to winter quarters and one, I think, on the way west. And so, hence, the three names. The others, now, slavery, let's see, I'm trying to figure, how should I present this? Um, let's keep it real. In coming into the Westwood t Territory and settling here, they arrived here in 1847, right? When was slavery legally sanctioned in Utah? Does anyone know? Five years later, in 1852. Now why did it take five years to legally sanction what was in existence from the time that the Latter-day Saint parties under the leadership of President Young arrived. It wasn't something that necessarily they chose to do, but within a larger context, one of the critical issues of the period in the aftermath of the end of the Spanish uh, Mexican-American War was what to do with the new lands that had been acquired as a result of the American victory. 
and the war ended with Mexico in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and the Latter-day Saint leadership was in a pretty precarious position. They needed to walk a fine line so as not to do anything to alienate either the slaveholding interests or anti-slaveholding interests. It wasn't abolitionism in the sense, uh, but more of opposition to the expansion of slavery into any of the new territories. And it really wasn't so much this little spot in uh, near the Rockies that we came to know. It was called Deseret, but there was a more greater prize. Where was that prize? California. And it became even more a prize that needed to be organized in the aftermath of the discovery of gold. And the Latter-day Saint leaders were very, very sensitive to their position. They wanted political recognition. And they wanted political recognition not as a territory, but as a state. A state equal to the other sister states in the Union. And so they sought, and you might say were pretty successful at walking a fine line. There was even talk of tying Utah's application to the efforts to make California a state with the understanding that at a given period in time, not too long, that Utah could break off from California and come into the Union as a sister state among the states of the Union. Uh, Peter Burnett, who was the governor of the state of California at that time, did not endorse the idea. He didn't see where it was in, in, in any way advantageous to, to the state of California. So, what the petition was there before the Congress, a delegate, two de delegates were sent from Utah uh, to represent Deseret's petitions in uh, Congress. One of the delegates was a man by the name of John Bernheiser, Dr. John Bernheiser who had a very close relationship with President Smith and subsequently Brigham Young and who knew a lot of people back in Washington and was a great de delegate. Uh, Dr. Bernheisel and others recommended to President Young that no mention be made of the presence or the possible existence of slavery in Utah or Deseret. They were well aware that if that information leaked out to the Congress at large, that it would doom their quest for political recognition. They were seeking legitimacy. And they were also very much concerned about being able to hold on to those territories and lands which they had, uh, the boundaries that they claimed which were a little bit exorbitant. And so that is in part why it takes so long to legally sanction slavery in what was to become Utah territory. And in Utah became a part of the United States as a territory in 1850 as a part of the Compromise of 1850, which most of you may recall from previous experiences in high school and history classes. 1850, and then two years later, February of 1852, the Utah legislature moved to legally enact laws sanctioning slavery. And in this case, they passed 
two bills. One was for the uh, legal sanctioning of enslavement of Indians, which they really didn't intend to enslave Indians, but they were very concerned about the uh, long existing slave trade between uh, people in, in Mexico and, and in the Southwest area. And so that took place in 1852. And so also did the legal sanctioning of the enslavement of Africans, uh, Americans. Now, there weren't very many slaves in Utah. The 18, 50 census indicates that there were 50 blacks in Utah. And 24 of them, or 26, I'm a little bit shaky on the number, were said to have been free. And the other 24 slaves who were en route to California Normally, you never see the names of slaves in the census. But in this case, and lucky for my interest, you find in the, uh, in the uh, census schedule, at the end of the census, the list, the name of every slave in the valley, their color, their age, their sex, and uh, who they were owned by en route to California. Later, we find out that some of those listed as en route to California never left what had become Utah. And there is a move on the part of a group of a colonizing venture from Utah to Southern California, San Bernardino, in 1851. And so, Amos Lyman and Who else, Ross? Charles C. Rich. Yeah, C.C. C. Rich. Dr. Rich's ancestor will probably get, he'll get on me for not remembering that. Uh, and that, and it's a, that's an interesting story in and of itself, in that of the group of African Americans who went there, against the advice of President Young, who told the, the slave owners, you take them there, California had come into the Union as a free state, and boom, you're going to be without your slave labor. And that does have a, 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 a part of our larger Utah story. So that some five years after arriving in San Bernardino, one of the Latter-day Saints slave owners, Robert M. Smith, who went there and took his slaves, he'd come originally from Mississippi, I guess thought he, Sunshine State was better, and he went and he decided that California wasn't working for him, so he was going to go to Texas and take his slaves with him. But there were efforts on the part of a couple of African Americans who got in contact with a woman by the name of Biddy Mason. Uh, and she told them her story. The authorities prevented Smith from taking it, went to, and there's a major court case in Southern California in 1856, in which she and her children and some other of the blacks uh, who slaves who had went to California uh, became free men and women of color, became free persons of color. And I um, can't do her story, but this is a remarkable story. Biddy, Bridget Mason, she goes on to do good investments and hard work to become one of the wealthiest black women in the United States of America. Uh, she is a, a major hero in California's African American history. And most people do not have any connection with her as part of the westward trek from Mississippi across to Utah in 1848 and then to California in 1851. Uh, that's that's Latter-day Saint history. That's Utah history in part. The, in, 
Another, several of these African Americans who were compelled to go to Southern California, some of them returned to Utah when President Young, in the aftermath, in, what, in the midst of what they call the Utah War, called some of the colonizing ventures in. And that's how you explain, in part, the presence of some of the people of African descent in what uh, is, we refer to as St. George, or some of you all still refer to as uh, Dixie. Uh, they originally came to, Ute, to, to the Salt Lake area, then went to California, and they came, and they ended up returning back into that, that area. And so we have here the, the experience of the men and women who were in bondage. Most of them were engaged in agricultural pursuits. That is, they worked on the small farms of the area, family farms. A few of them, of the slave owners, were artisans or merchants, and they used their slave labor in their respective businesses. One black female slave served as a midwife for the residents in her area, and, perform and others performed household duties or worked on church and public buildings. Like slaves throughout the country, Utah slaves had to contend with the possibility of being sold or separated from loved ones and friends or being physically disciplined. Some ran away with traveling parties through Utah and others thought the mountains were a barrier to a successful escape and complained about the climate being quite different from the South. Several Utah slave owners were related by blood and marriage or were long-term time friends. Example, William Crosby's sister, Scytha, was married to William Lay. Crosby, Lay, both part of the Mississippi Saints group of 1848 that came west. Another sister, Nancy, was the wife of John H. Bankhead. Similar relationships existed among the slaves. Hartley's sister, Martha, married Green Flake, who was one of the first three to come into the valley, along with, uh, with Oscar Hartley and Oscar Crosby. Alexander Bankhead and Marinda Red married after they gained their freedom. There's one aspect of Utah slavery that appears to have been unique. As president and prophet of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Brigham Young exercised enormous power over the saints. And this affected secular as well as ecclesiastical matters. President Young did not own slaves, and he believed in humane treatment for slaves. On occasion, President Young served as an intermediary between Latter-day Saint slave owners as well as between slaves and masters. There are accounts of disgruntled slaves taking their concerns to him and seeking temporary refuge in his home away from an owner. Although Latter-day Saint leaders fully embraced the biblical justification for African-American slavery and had passed the slave code in 1852, slavery never flourished in Utah. That cannot be explained simply by talking about climate and geography. The 1860 Utah census lists only 29 slaves in the territory. Utah, I think it can be explained by thinking of Utah as a gathering place for the saints. And Mormons throughout the United States 
and Western Europe were encouraged to come to help build the kingdom of God on earth. From the saints perspective and certainly from President Young's, the labor needs were to be fulfilled by free white workers. Brigham Young never intended for slavery to flourish in Utah. He wrote William Crosby and said, quote, we do not wish to encourage the sale of slaves in these valleys. Saying that if Utah was admitted to the Union as a state, that it would be a free state, President Young told the noted newspaper editor Horace Greeley, quote, slavery here would prove useless and unprofitable. Useless and emphasis on unprofitable. He was a bottom line guy. I, President Young went on to say, I regard it generally as a curse to the masters. Utah is not adopted to slave labor. The legal sanctions for slavery in Utah ended in 1862 when the Congress abolished slavery and involuntary servitude in the territories of the United States. Now it is unclear as to whether Utah slave owners were aware of the congressional actions and immediately complied with the federal statute. In 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation received coverage in Utah newspapers. Some owners may have waited until the 13th Amendment ended slavery in the United States to end slavery. I've uh, had a chance to interview and spend some time from time to, with some of the descendants of, of these slaves. And uh, it's, it's been interesting. It's been interesting. Not all of the pioneers who came to Utah of African descent were slaves. Some of them came because they had heard the message of the missionaries in their respective communities and were so moved that they felt compelled to become members of this new church. One of them was a man by the name of Elijah Abel. Elijah Abel was from Ohio, and in 1853, he relocated to Utah. He was a master carpenter. On this journey, the group included Abel, his wife, and children. He had first joined the church around 1832. By the time that he arrived in Utah, he was and had been the first black priesthood holder. His skills as a master carpenter led to his working on temples in Nauvoo and Salt Lake City. And he passed away on Christmas Day, 1884. His obituary described him as a successful missionary in Canada and the United States, an elder and a 70, and a Latter-day Saint who had died, quote, in full faith of the gospel. Some of his descendants are still in Utah today. Mashiro, has been for a number of years a woman by the name of Jane Elizabeth Manning James. She too was a free woman of color, born in Wilton, Connecticut. 
She was one of five children whose parents were Isaac and Phyllis Manning, a free black family. Although Jane was a member of the local Presbyterian church, she remained spiritually unfulfilled until 1842 when she heard the message of a missionary for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. One year following her conversion, Jane Elizabeth and several family members who had also converted decided to move to Nauvoo, Illinois, the headquarters of the Latter-day Saint Church. After traveling by boat to Buffalo, New York, these black saints, unable to pay additional fares, began what was an 800-mile journey by foot to Nauvoo. In Nauvoo, Jane was able to live and work in the home of Joseph and Emma Smith. I need not say who he was now, right? Not for this group. The founder of the Latter-day Saint and his wife. Following the 1844 murder of President Smith Jr. and his brother Hiram in Carthage, Latter-day Saint leaders under Brigham Young decided to abandon Nauvoo. A decision was made to look for a safe haven in the West, and in the fall of 1847, Jane and her husband Isaac and two sons traveled across the plains to the new home of the Latter-day Saints. She arrived in the fall of 1847, they were the first free black pioneers in the new Mormon settlement of, of Deseret. And Jane spent the remaining 51 years of her life in Utah. They shared the trials and tribulations of their fellow saints and engaged in the spirit of mutual aid and cooperation that characterized pioneer life. I wrote an extended article on her and I, and several years ago. And I put it to, ready to send it off. And in fact, I sent it off. And I wasn't happy. The text was fine. I was okay with the piece. But I made reference, the title, which was, I thought was kind of neat, but it was messed up. It was Jane Elizabeth James, a African-American Mormon woman. This is a book on black women confront the West. And I, it, it just didn't sit well with me because I felt I was disrespecting her. So I changed the title. And I changed the title to something I thought she would fit better, set, set better with her. And she was a strong-willed woman. Some of these early sisters in the church, they were, uh, I changed the I title of the article to Jane Elizabeth Manning James, a Mormon African-American woman, because that's who she saw herself as. That's how she lived her life. And she was just, uh, I've got two Latter-day Saint African-American women who I've just adored. One is Jane Elizabeth Manning James, and the other one is Mary Lucille Perkins Bankhead. Uh, scared of both of them, although I never met uh, <laughs> Sister Jane. In Jane's later life, and, and I don't know, something, some of us are in the same range. I mean, I, I think about, I've been pretty good going to church here the last 30 years or something, because I was thinking, you know, I, I'm trying to get into the kingdom. And uh, it's amazing how, how my parents raised me has really come full circle. And uh, Jane, 
began to increasingly concerned about her place in the afterlife. Sing your song. She was aware of the Latter-day Saint Church's prescriptions that prohibited blacks from full participation in the rituals that were prerequisite to being eligible for a place in the celestial kingdom. She knew her stuff. She persisted in making her case to several church leaders for more than a decade. They were steadfast in refusing her request. Although they tried to pacify her by authorizing limited participation in Latter-day Saint rituals. Through it all, she remained a devout Latter-day Saint and is generally recognized in Latter-day Saint history for her unwavering faith. A special monument to her faith is located in the Salt Lake City Cemetery close to her gravesite. And at the time in which funds were being raised to uh, support this, some of the money came from within the Latter-day Saint Church and, and members and everything. So I don't even know who it was. Maybe you could, somebody asked me about a donation or something. And I, I thought, and I, I couldn't say no, because I'd made a lot of money off of Jane <laughs> over the years, and I had a sense of guilt. And plus, she's, you know, she was just a remarkable woman. Uh, her and Mrs. Bankhead. In addition, now Mrs. Bankhead, I mentioned her name. For her, it's, no question, if you arrived after the, the joining of the rails, you're not a pioneer. And I, I didn't have the courage to tell her she was wrong and that I didn't agree when she was alive. And uh, I can say this to you, and I, you all are not going to say anything when you say your prayers to her about me challenging that. This is Samuel and Amanda Chambers. Are any of you familiar with her? Can you see it in the back? I like this so much, we can just, don't. Sure, yes, you don't mind. I'll have to do it to it. Don't drop it now. I first saw this on a, on a dust jacket of a book about African-Americans in the West. And I said, wow, look at that. Boy, boy, boy. And I fell in love with, with that. I mean, I just think that that's, to me, it's a work of art. L look at the time. This had to be late 19th, maybe early 20th century uh, that is taken. They're laid out. They're, they're decked. They got on, dressed to the nines. Dressed to the nines. A handsome couple. Just a, a very, very handsome couple. Samuel Chambers lived from 1831 to 1929. Amanda from 1840 to 1925. And like the majority of black Americans living in the South in pre-Civil War America, they were slaves. Samuel was born in 1831 in Pickens County, Alabama. Amanda was born in 1840 in Knoxville County, Mississippi. Samuel's father was his owner, James Davidson. His mother, Hester Gillespie was one of Davidson's slaves. 
and following the sale of his mother, Samuel was sold to Maxfield Chambers, a Mississippi resident. At the age of 13, Samuel responded to the preaching of Mississippian Preston Thomas, a recent convert to the Latter-day Saint faith, and Thomas baptized Samuel Chambers in 1844. In the ensuing decades, Chambers married, fathered the son, Peter, and endured the sorrow of losing his first wife. Samuel also fathered two additional children, and in 1858, he married Amanda Legron, the daughter of Green and Hattie Legron. Some of you might recognize the Legron name in terms of early African American history in Utah. All were slaves, the property of David Legron of Mississippi. Samuel and Amanda did not have children. And with the passage of the 13th Amendment in 1865, ending slavery, Samuel and Amanda gained their freedom along with nearly four million other African Americans. Now, Samuel had been a saint, was, was a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But he had had no contact with other saints for nearly a quarter of a century. And yet, he remained steadfast in his faith. And in 1866, he and his family began to prepare for a journey west. In 1870, without support or encouragement from fellow Mormons, the Chambers began their overland journey to join their fellow saints in Utah Territory. They were accompanied by Peter Chambers and Amanda's brother, Edward Ned Legron and his young family. The Chambers and Legron families arrived in Salt Lake City in April of 1870. And upon arriving, Samuel and Amanda quickly became involved in Latter-day Saint activities. As members of the 8th Ward, they attended meetings regularly, tithed, and donated in response to additional church financial requests. Amanda was baptized, and Samuel accepted rebaptism in 1875. Because of his race, Samuel Chambers was prohibited from holding the male-only priesthood. And most would agree in terms of new work that's been done. It used to, for years, there was argument over the whole priesthood. That's, that's Brigham Young's thing. It certainly wasn't there with the president, Prophet Joseph Smith. I know. I, oh, well, I, I've read this stuff. I don't really know. He was, Samuel, appointed an assistant deacon of 8th Ward and Amanda served as a Relief Society deaconess. The primary responsibility of deacons was to care for the meeting houses, a job primarily consisting of custodial duties. Within a few years after arriving in Salt Lake City, the Samuels family relocated to the Mill Creek area southeast of Salt Lake where they farmed. By World War I, they had acquired a 30-acre plot of land, and they received wide recognition for the quality of their produce, especially their grapes and currants. Samuel was awarded first prize in several agricultural fairs. Amanda was recognized for her cooking abilities, especially the cakes and pies prepared for Latter-day Saint social functions. Although restricted in fully participating in their chosen faith, 
Amanda and Samuel remained devout believers. Samuel remained illiterate, but Amanda utilized a guffy speller to teach herself how to read and write. In 1924, as a testament to their church family's high regard for the chambers, numerous saints attended their 66th wedding anniversary, an event that was described in the Desert News, the church-owned daily newspaper. Their funerals were also well attended. Amanda Chambers died in 1925 at the age of 85. Samuel Chambers passed away four years later in 1929 at the age of 98. They were buried in the Elysian Garden Cemetery in the Mill Creek area of Salt Lake County. Doesn't get any better than this. I think at this point, I've gone way over my time limit. And Darius has to get up early in the morning to get the car ready. Uh, I mean, this is fascinating work. And I've been out of the saddle now for two years, and oh, this tie is killing me. And, so with that, why don't we close it up and have any questions I may be able to, uh, you may have, and I may be able to respond to, and if I can't respond to them, I've got Darius and Dr. Peterson here to, to, to more than handle, carry the load. Thank you very much.